Well, welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans with the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creation, and really for all those like great stories. I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this ride through the complex biologic architecture that represents aging and the processes of and diseases of aging. So, you know, there's been quite a bit of activity over the past few years in uh, sort of the niche of aging biotechnology uh, that has to do with damage repair. And we mentioned damage, we're usually referring to a range of molecular damage, cellular damage, tissue and organ damage that ultimately leads to downstream pathologies, degeneration, uh, suffering and death. And there's been quite a lot of activity going on in the area of developing technologies for repairing these damage events after they happen uh, as a means to restore health and vitality. Um, however, exciting as that particular area of rejuvenation biotechnology is, we can't forget that upstream from those damage events sits a very complex metabolic architecture you know, across our 50 trillion cells that quietly chugs along behind the scenes and you know, throughout our daily lives produces more damage. Uh, you know, what we sort of refer to as the side effects of living. Uh, these processes involve nutrient signaling, mitochondrial dynamics, uh, intracellular and paracrine communications, ultimately all of which, you know, due to time and randomness, start to go awry. Uh, so today's guest on the show, who's going to take us further along this theme uh, and important bioproduct interventions to help restore and rebalance this loss of metabolic homeostasis that occurs, uh, is Dr. Matthew Roberts. Uh, he is the Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President of Innovation at the Chromadex Corporation. Uh, Matt has a bachelor's uh, in molecular biology from Purdue. He's got a PhD in toxicology from Cornell and an MBA from Washington University's Olin Business School and has spent the last 25 years in various cross-functional roles across multiple industry segments, food, pet care, pharma, consumer health, functional nutrition, uh, and has worked at market leaders including Nestle, Purina, Abbott, uh, Nature's Bounty, Pharmavite, and now currently a Chromadex, which you know is clearly becoming a global leader in an extremely hot area, uh, and that is of uh, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or commonly known as NAD, and its related bioproducts. But we'll get into that a bit later on. Uh, he's a member of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Corporate Advisory Board, uh, and he has served at, at sort of numerous advisory roles on various investment and venture capital firms, and actually having sat across the table from him on numerous occasions in the past, he's without a doubt one of the coolest business development DC guys that you, you want to negotiate with. Uh, so all wow. that being said, uh, Matt, <laughs> thanks so much for, for coming on the show. But thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today. And um, I've got a lot to live up to to that intro, so uh, I appreciate you keeping the keeping the bar very high there. So, uh, but we're, in all seriousness, I'm really really happy to be here. You and I have known each other for a number of years, and uh, well, I really appreciate. It. I think you'll definitely <laughs> you'll definitely live up to it. Um, yeah. The you know typically on this show we we give our guests the floor at the beginning just so they you know audience can learn more about you, uh, basically your background, you know, how you got interested in science, molecular biology, toxicology, and ultimately you know the path you know how you transitioned uh, into these executive roles, which really in 2019 put you at the epicenter of science and business. It, you know it's one of the major global food, farm, and nutrition companies in the world. Uh, it's been a really, uh, really interesting ride. I'm, I'm very grateful to be in science and to have, have participated in so many different areas. Um, when I was at Purdue, um, I actually started off as an engineer and was excited about that. But it was right at the time when, you know, molecular biology and all of sort of the genomic technologies were, were taking off. And um, fundamentally, I was, I was motivated and still am and passionate about, about technology as much as it is science. And I was reading about laboratory robotics and, you know, um, high throughput sequencing and thought, wow, if I could kind of work with those machines, um, uh, that, that would be great. So um, the rest of my career has kind of been at the, at the interface of science and technology. So my PhD was really inventing and developing 
uh, analytical instrumentation to do a lot of that bioanalytical work, whether it be sequencing or microarrays or um, uh, high, high throughput electrophoresis or chromatography. Um, and the really neat thing about that is then as I went into the food nutrition industry through, through the, the companies that you mentioned, Nestle and Abbott in particular, uh, I got to work with some of the best uh, nutritionists and life sciences scientists in the world. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have worked with them because they, they, they really taught me um, everything I know about, about uh, healthy living and, and all of the science that now supports that. Um, and so, so that technology took me on a, on a path um, to really learn from others mm -hmm. and to really develop a, a really, really cool network of people that really see the future uh, of healthy living. And again, that's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing uh, to develop and prove, but um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be on that journey with, with a lot of other great people around the world. So that's kind of how I got here. Um, you know, when I, when I come to Chromadex, um, uh, I was fortunate, I knew, I've known Frank Jackson, who's the founder of the company, for probably 15 years of that, of that career that you described. Mm -hmm. And about four years ago, he approached me to join the scientific advisory board here. And uh, my, good, my good friend and mentor, Bruce German, was also on the scientific advisory board. Um, at the time, my, my partner in Nestle Venture Capital, a guy named Steve Allen, was, on the, was the chairman of the board of Chromadex. And so a lot of really cool people in my life uh, came together around Chromadex. And as I learned more, I just realized that we were sitting on a gold mine, not only in terms of the science and technology, but but we're kind of in the right place at the right time. You know, the, the healthy aging market is is really booming. People are need healthy living solutions more and more as they age. Uh, that's almost a, an obvious statement. But um, so really felt good then about uh, joining full time uh, last October. Awesome, awesome. You know, it's it's um, having sort of watched your journey and sort of interfaced with you in the past. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a very today, you know, thinking back, say, 20 years or so, it, we find ourselves in a very different uh, industry overall. Uh, you know, if you go back 20 years or so, say 2000, uh, you know, you had uh, pharmaceutical companies that were developing drugs. You had the food companies that were basically developing food. And then in the middle, there was this agglomeration of various types of companies, dietary supplements, nutraceuticals, functional foods, medical foods. Um, and, you know, at the time we sort of sit around debating sort of where everything was going to go in, in the next 20 years, what the future held. Um, and now, you know, here in 2019, uh, we have a really very interesting environment. We have you know, high-end bio-nutritional companies like Chromadex that are you know, developing ingredients with clearly sort of pharmaceutical style rigor uh, and studies. Uh, you have pharmaceutical companies, on the other hand, that are developing drug entities that aren't, you know, don't, don't look anything like drugs at all when you think about sort of microbiome products and digital therapeutics and so forth. And then you have food companies that, you know, like I'm thinking Nestle off the top of my head, uh, you know, they have these claims of functional benefits that are quite far beyond, you know, this thing is high in vitamin C, uh, you know, really, you know, complex claims. Can you just talk a little bit about your perspective on sort of where you see things today in 2019 and sort of where this is all going uh, as the space continues to mature? I think, I think that's uh, a great context in which we, which we operate. Um, yeah, I think if you go back about 20 years ago, um, that was kind of really the big push on functional foods or nutraceuticals, as you suggested. And there was a couple of things that were coming together there is, is I think people didn't realize it quite as much, but this idea of healthy living mm -hmm. needed as much science and technology as a medical intervention for a disease state. It was different and you had to handle it differently. You had to handle it with multiple uh, so solutions or approaches. Um, but but, I, but there was both a, a scientific development around, around some of those non-pharma, non-surgery, non-diagnostic areas um, that complemented um, more, more traditional research into disease state. Mm -hmm. 
I think over the last 20 years, and what, what you've seen is, is kind of a specialization there. There are companies that you know, focus just on dietary supplements, just on functional foods, uh, just on exercise, sleep, um, uh, just on pharma. There's a lot of medical device developments, you know, you know drug eluting stents being uh, one of the most, uh, the foremost example in, in the consumer's minds. So there's a lot of, a lot of categories that have developed uh, around to keep us healthier longer, either from the medical approach or from kind of what I'm calling healthy living. I think, I think the, the failure in the market though, uh, now becomes that specialization. So mm. everybody wants to treat healthy aging um, narrowly in their category. Uh. A dietary supplement company wants to fix you through dietary supplements. A medical device company wants to fix you through medical devices and so on and so forth. Farm has been that way for a long time. That's not an overt criticism of their business model. It's just when you look at the market, I think, I think we're failing, the, the market is failing to serve consumers sometimes by not offering integrated solutions. Interesting. So one of the things also I was really excited about Chromadex, and I'm not saying we, 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 we've solved healthcare in, in North America at this point, but <laughs> um, is, is while we sell a dietary supplement, we really almost see ourselves as more of a, a consumer biotech company or a, 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 a healthy aging company. What we're really about, you know, you, you, you said something interesting at the, at the beginning, you know, we've got 50 trillion cells, I think is the number that, that, that you quoted. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that living is hazardous for those cells. That's a, a basic philosophical maxim, living is hazardous for those cells. Sure. And so what we believe is, 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 is a great area to approach is, is how do we keep those cells healthier longer? So cellular health, mm -hmm. cellular aging or lack thereof. So, so that's one of the reasons I got excited because that kind of liberates us from saying, we have to sell you this in this format at this time. We can really approach it as how do we keep your cells healthier longer and, and as many of them as possible Right. So that you can enjoy all the benefits of a of, of not just a longer life, but a more active, more vital life uh, along the same way. So now we do happen to okay. Anyway, let me let me pause there and and see if I was clear. <laughs> no, it, it completely, completely, and and it's uh, uh, it, it's nice to see the you know sort of your thought process behind this and sort of the uh, you know not just looking at you know providing that one sort of vertical let's say but thinking that you know this is a aging is this combinatorial problem and we cannot just you know deal with one pillar of it there there's so much more and i think that's yeah you know, an, an extremely important perspective um and we, and we start to, we also start to see that in the market now too those words uh, like cellular energy cellular health mm -hmm. um so we, we kind of kind of feel that there's also a, a, a consumer resonance with what that means that's not too you know, that that that's an understandable and, and educatable topic and how do you how do you keep your cells healthy and well energized if we take it down uh, another kind of another layer in the science what's really behind that is mitochondrial health or mitochondrial bioenergetics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and really the the, the the vast part of our uh, science portfolio and our science investment is really in that area, mitochondrial bioenergetics. And we know that as you age, your mitochondria become uh, less efficient or less effective at generating energy. And that, and that is uh, in some cases correlated, in some cases causative with a number of different things that you face in, 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 in aging. So, so we feel we can be very, very focused as a small company on on a discrete area of metabolism but have very broad effects on that sure. cellular health and cellular energy sure sure so so with that let's let's talk a little bit more about uh nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide so known as nad and sort of the family of, of related uh, factors and, and bioproducts uh, clearly a space which you guys are becoming the dominant player in uh you know i think you probably agree with me that 
uh, ingredients in the sort of bio-nutritional space, it's kind of a rare thing <laughs> to see blockbusters, uh, you know, as it's traditionally referred to in pharma, uh, and some of these products becoming major household names. Um, yet, you know, I, I took a recent scan into clinicaltrials.gov, and I was just blown away that there's uh, almost 800 current studies, either recruiting or ongoing or completed, related to NAD. Uh, PubMed had 11,000 papers on the topic. Uh, and, and for those unfamiliar with NAD, short overview, and Matt will go more into this, but you know, it's this cofactor or, or helper molecule that's found in all the 50 trillion cells of your body. It's got many important roles in metabolism, uh, probably most importantly in redox chemistry or cellular respiration, uh, and, and you're dead without it. So uh, the fact that it drops off over time as we age is not a good thing. Matt, could you take us through uh, NAD sort of related family of, of products like nicotinamide riboside, uh, and sort of down this path about sort of how you went about developing this blockbuster ingredient, which, you know, was discovered 100 years ago, you know, sort of 1906 or whenever, and, you know, where you've come with it in terms of dosage forms, how you see its future development, uh, different functional properties, new clinical indications, and so forth. Yeah, uh, uh, a great and broad set of questions there. So the um, um, I'll kind of I'll kind of work my way down from the mitochondrial bioenergetics, and so so central to that is NA, NAD, as you as you point out, which is a central uh, part of that um, that bioenergetic pathway that that delivers energy to do work in in, in the fifty trillion cells of your body. Um, it's, it's uh, a, a key molecule in the electron transport chain that ultimately uh, generates ATP, which is the, 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 the final electron donor acceptor uh, in the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. And so NAD can, can it not only serves as a critical role in that pathway, but it can also serve as kind of a buffer, like an energy buffer or reserve. Uh, some might call it like a, like the battery for your cell, right? So that um, because it's actually at any given time you don't want you don't want too little energy, but you also don't want too much because mm -hmm. uh, it's it's almost like economics. If supply and demand are out of sync, mm -hmm. usually bad things happen either way. Um, but at the same time, when you need energy to do work, it's got to be there like that. So the cell is, you know, uses NAD kind of to kind of almost as a little bit of a storehouse, so that on tap it can it can it can create the energy uh, to to do the work that it needs to at the right moment. So I just kind of want to explain that there's so NAD has this really really cool role in in, in multiple ways uh, coming out of bioenergetics. So 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 one of the principles then is how how do you keep NAD levels healthy, how do you boost them if they're low into a, a normal or, or healthy state? Mm -hmm. So there's a number of precursors. So if we were to diagram the, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the bioenergetic pathway, there would be a number of precursors uh, that could help to generate NAD. A lot of them ha would have issues to deliver as either a therapy or a supplement or any of the forms that we, we've talked about. Some have difficulty to get into the cell. Mm -hmm. Some are metabolized one place and not in others before they would get to certain cells. Some go, some would get to certain cells, but not others, right? And so that's a, there's a lot of review articles and that, that's, a, that's an interesting area of science in and of itself. Yeah. And um, not only what is an NAD precursor, but you know, which ones are effective and where do they go and how are they metabolized, right? So uh, a lot of what our research would, would say was that, is that and what we believe is that N NR or nicotinamide riboside um, is the most effective uh, NAD booster uh, that, 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 that's available, that's been, that's been discovered. Um, and so uh, a lot of our focus as a business has been about nicotinamide riboside. Now we're not, uh, you say we're not um, we're not forgetting about uh, any of those other molecules, and, and sure. we study those and we compare and contrast those in some of our studies. 
Uh, but again and again, it seems that nicotinamide riboside is a very effective NAD booster. And then by consequence, when you raise NAD levels or get them back to healthier levels, you help those cells perform the functions that they were designed to do. Mm -hmm. And then when they're in tissues and whole bodies and organs and people out having fun by the beach, uh, it, it, it allows them to, to, to function at a high, and, you know, to use the word, vital level. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of been our focus. You talked a little bit about the history, right? So, mm -hmm. and you'd, all, you'd also uh, uh, rightly pointed out some numbers um, uh, indicating hundreds of studies on clinicaltrials.gov, probably thousands of publications that you could look at in NAD metabolism and in, in mitochondrial health probably over the last, depends on your time frame, but um, certainly even over the last 10 years, you know, the, the number of studies either in progress or published would be, be well into the hundreds, if not thousands. Right. What that signals, and, and actually if you chart it out over time, you, you can see that that's really, really ramped up in the last 10 years. Why? Uh, because uh, particularly coming out of the pharma world, there was a lot of receptor ligand related research. So they would look at one pathway, look for a drug that will target, hit that. And then a lot of uh, ingredients or whatever, or, or nutraceuticals would kind of spin off of that research, be some mm -hmm. natural equivalent or right. get to the pathway in a slightly different way, but in a more milder way. So, but people, but, but, but the whole research establishment didn't focus very much on the organelle. Okay. Um, in general, <laughs> there's other organelles other than the mitochondria, of course, there's the Golgi or something like, you know, and there's, there's some interesting research into the, into the Golgi as an example. But over the last 10 years, there's been this aha moment in science where the, the, these organelles are, are, are very interesting, uh, both for treatment as well as for prevention. Uh, and so there's been this huge uh, um, amount of research that, that has gone in there. And again, I told you about one of the reasons I'm excited about Chromadex, you know, right place, right time, right? Mm -hmm. Is, um, is, 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 is we, we happen to be in that Venn diagram as well, right? And the overall oh, yeah. mitochondrial. Uh, health. Um, maybe to give you some additional numbers, though, is that so just for NR, uh, within that spectrum of uh, NAD trials and, and, and publications or whatever, um, there's, and this has come from our MTA program, a material transfer agreement. We have a program where uh, we supply research grade or clinical grade uh, research material to researchers around the world. You know, we we want to ensure that it's good science. We review the protocol and things like that. But but if it's really really good science that's promoting uh, healthy living, if the outcome is positive, then we're going to uh, you know we're we're going to be ship material and help and help support that research. So to give you some numbers there, out of that program, uh, there's been over 160 research. Uh, collaborations to that. Yeah. Um, over a hundred of the of that 160 have resulted in peer-reviewed uh, publications. Yeah. So uh, in fact over a hundred are, are, those are pre, uh, mainly preclinical but over a hundred uh, uh, peer-reviewed research publications. Um, they've been in very high profile journals. There's been Nature articles, there's uh, been PNAS articles, there's been um, you know, uh, the, so the cell and, and mm -hmm. cell articles. Uh, there's been a, 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 not only the number of publications has been high, but the scientific impact in the highest journals in the land have, have you know, pub research has generated those sort of publications, if you will. Uh, and that's all NR coming from, from, our, um, from our program. Yes. Um, there's uh, over 24. Uh, it's always hard to count because there's always a new one popping up, but <laughs> I think the last time I looked was about 24 human clinical trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov, the same site that you, you quoted on the NAD, that are for uh, human clinical trials using our NR from our MTA program. So what, um, and there's four of those have been published, by the way, four, four human clinical trials have been uh, published in peer-reviewed journals. So what that indicates is kind of like that momentum or that wave that we talked about with NAD. Uh, the same is true or even more true for NR. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, over the last five years, over 160 public, uh, collaborations, 100, 100 publications for human clinical trials, and now there's at least 24 more uh, in the pipeline that will be coming out over the next couple of years. Um, so so the, the, the exciting thing about that, the, those are not just sort of big numbers and things, but it, again, it indicates this momentum True around nicotinamide riboside in particular, and kind of backs up our, our claim that NR is the most effective NAD booster and, and, and a very important uh, uh, science and technology for mitochondrial health, cellular energy, cellular um, health. Along that path, um, there was, you know, just last week, I think, you know, there was a major announcement in the Journal of American College of Cardiology uh, related to NR, uh, cardiovascular health. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know it was breaking news <laughs> in recent days and it was kind of exciting. So do you mind going into a bit of sort of... Yeah, um, the, 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 the Jack study, as we lovingly refer to it, was... Um, was really powerful in a number of ways. Uh, you know, one is there's uh, Professor A.J. Shaw and Dr. Eunice uh, uh, Smurius from King's College. The, the, those are well-published articles in, in the area of, of, of mitochondrial health. King's College is, is, is kind of known for this work. And so just, just right off the bat, the credibility of the authors and then of the publication. You know, we always look at scientific impact factor that has a, you know, Jack has an impact factor of 16, which puts it into probably the top few percent of, 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 of journals. So, so that, that in itself was, was exciting. Scientifically, what was interesting, uh, and one of the reasons it got into such a, um, an esteemed publication, is that it had discoveries around the mechanism of action. Right. But then it was able to show that by altering that, that mechanism, you could have um, physiological consequences and whole organism benefits, right. right? And so it's a rare study that puts those three things together. So um, it showed that uh, nicotinamide riboside uh, helped maintain heart function even when the heart was under stress. And it did so by stimulating a very conserved cellular response called the uh, mitochondrial un unfolded uh, protein response, mm. or the UPR. That itself is a, a whole area of study. There's, there's people who do nothing but spend their lives studying the, the UPR <laughs> response. Oh, yeah. um, and and so, so through that mechanism, um, the, the heart tissue is essentially able to be rescued from the the, the stress that it was underneath. And, and then on, no, on a number of physiological parameters, uh, much as a human cardiologist look, this is a mouse study, I should say, it's a preclinical study, uh, but, but by kind of the same measures a cardiologist would, would measure a human, you know, the, 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 the heart function of the mouse uh, was either maintained or got better from a, a deficient state. Um, they, they tied that into early preliminary human results as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and but but the study you know clearly segues into um, a larger human clinical trial, which I won't cover today. But you know, it's kind of stay tuned, right? Well, really, really exciting, exciting moment for us. And uh, and and then again, a nice thing about the program too is like as we as we look at all these researchers, when when a researcher has you know exciting results uh, like that, it allows us to do to double down and form a deeper relationship with them and. Um, you know, continue that research. So it also kind of gives us that broad uh, perspective on what's really working sure. and, and then what, yeah, that's exciting. What, you know, as exciting as that is, let's now sort of look to the future. Okay. <laughs> You know, I think we're constantly looking at futuristic stuff here, but, you know, we talked about the last 20 years. Uh, let's put a crystal, your crystal ball for a moment and look for the next 20. Uh, what are you most excited about? Uh, the certain products, product classes. What do you see for 2040? Uh, it, it, I mean, yeah. obviously, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot that could happen, but, you know, knowing what you know now is just about sort of the products, but the technologies as they're developing alongside them, the biomarkers, the diagnostics, everything that's going on in the space. What do you think is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years? Well, I'll kind of go, I'll break it down into kind of five 
five, 10, and 20 years. Okay. Right? So it's in that increments to build up to the end point of your question. Um, yeah, I would say over the next five years, what we're going to see is uh, that body of work that I just described to you on, on sort of an NR, uh, NR as an NAD precursor. Mm -hmm. um, um, leading to more and more physiological benefits like we saw in the Jack paper. We'll see that uh, there's already been four human clinical studies done, but we'll start to see those physiological benefits shown first in animal models and then again to human models. So, so basically the snapshot that I provided you uh, a moment ago will get deeper, but also broader. Okay. Um, and I think areas, um, that because, because we, there's so many studies done in the MTA, we can start to get an overview. And I think in the cardiovascular area in particular, uh, cardiovascular health, maintaining health for, you know, a vital life. Um, I think, I think we'll see a lot of, a, a lot more, uh, human clinicals, uh, mechanistic based studies that, 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 that demonstrate benefits to the whole population there. I think we're going to see um, uh, sort of offset by about a year, but we'll, we, we'll see similar sort of translational benefits to the brain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and uh, by maintaining cellular energy and cellular health through the mitochondrial bioenergetics, we'll, uh, we'll maintain for normal, healthy uh, uh, cognition for longer. I think I think we'll see some research that will come out and, and, and demonstrate that. Um, this idea of tissue rescue uh, could, you know, now if, if we go on into the five to 15 years or something like this, this idea of, of tissue rescue could, could take off on its own. Um, that may be more on the medical side than on the, certainly on the supplement side or things like that. But I was at the Keystone uh, Conference for Mitochondria and Aging last November. Okay. And there were numerous papers on rescuing, you know, whether it was kidney tissue, heart tissue, brain tissue, you name your tissue. But when it was under severe, and in that case, it's not, that's not currently in our business model, but, but you know, in, in areas of, of, of extreme stress, let's put it that way. And so I think you might see other forms or other types of products, uh, you, know, not, you know, either registered as pharma or medical devices or some combination thereof um, uh, that would help to re rescue tissues under stress. So I think, you know, we're fundamentally about prevention, but I think if you're asking to kind of predict the future, I think that would be an, an exciting offshoot that may use the same uh, the same science science technology basis, mm -hmm. uh, but de but delivered in another in another form. I think on the five, 10, 15, 20 year time frame, so these things are overlapping. What mm -hmm. you start to see is these things translated to population health. Okay. So you know you start with the animals, then you go to people, and then you get increasingly specific on the types of benefits. And then what you start to see is populations benefit from these, from these um, interventions or preventions. Um, and what the medical literature would point to now, and I think what our MTA research would point to as well, is that, um, it, um, that cellular energy, well-maintained, uh, retains a lot of healthy, youthful vitality. It, in essence, a lack of morbidity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think people will eventually study that at a population level and demonstrate it. Uh, demonstrate that that's generally good for the, for the population, not just you know, um, the, the typical populations in a clinical design. Uh, internally within uh, within Chromadex, I also run the regulatory function, and so that, that it's, it's interesting that, that your comment about the future kind of has a regulatory lens to it as well. So, sure. you know, right now we want to get 
um, you know, true niagen or nicotinamide riboside to as many people as possible around the world because of the benefits that we just talked about. So that requires obviously um, talking to regulators almost like we are now, right, about what those benefits are and why it's good for their populations and things. The, um, but I think there that morphs too, as we go farther into the future, um, working with governments to demonstrate population health of cellular energy uh, will be critical. Sure. Um, you know, Mars has recently commissioned this Cosmo study, uh, which is, I think, I'll probably misquote it, but 10 or 20,000 patients by the time it finishes and uh, looking at flavanols, co cocoa flavanols. Oh, right, right, right. And um, I'm not going to comment on that research, but, but, it, but it's an example <laughs> of a public private partnership, right? That, right. Um, that is attempting to demonstrate something at a population level. I think a much better, I, I mean, I, no, no, I'm not, uh, I'm very respectful of that research, but, but, but if I were a government, I think mitochondrial health and cellular energy uh, would, would be highly deserving of a public private uh, investment uh, to demonstrate these things again at the population level. Because that gets really interesting. I mean, right. the medical literature would suggest that you should do this now, but to make that sort of investment study, four or five thousand, ten thousand yeah. populations across a continent, or people across a continent on mitochondrial health, NAD levels, uh, how diets and supplementation or therapies affect that, I think would be, that's what I really see in the, in the sort of that medium term future that you were asking about. And, and that's where things get very, very exciting. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that would be an exciting uh, thing to yeah. do. Uh, yeah. to, <laughs> have to get that done, that would, that would be yeah. Yeah. I guess if the political will is there to do something of that nature, more, more power to it. Yeah. And on the, flip side, on the flip side of that, too, you know, there's um, uh, Charlie Brenner, who uh, was the original discoverer uh in uh in, in 20 if i get this right in 2004 when he was at dartmouth of mm -hmm. of nr being a nad precursor i'm not sure it was really known before that that nr was a nad precursor mm -hmm. um he looked at the postpartum effects of mothers of, of, of mouse mothers dams mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, supplemented with, with nr and the net result was that the pups were better, faster, and stronger. And that's not exactly a scientific description, but if you look at the results, that it, it, it points in those three, sure. those three directions. And we also know that, that NR um, uh, exists naturally in breast milk. Hmm. So, 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 so another part of the future, which we're just sort of scratching the surface on now is um, you know, kind of like DHA and that whole story of how that was discovered and how elevating levels to healthy breast milk levels in infants and toddlers was, was beneficial to them for a lot of areas of development. Sure. We, might, we might see something like that play out for NR or hmm. nicotine riboside as well. So, so that's really exciting. That's a whole nother area. It's a, that's healthy aging, but from the beginning. Right, right. Yeah, and it makes complete sense that, yeah. I mean, you need, whether it's when you're very young uh, or old, you need, cellular, you need cellular respiration to happen, as you said, the right balance. Uh, it, it makes, tell me when you're on. We're going. Okay. So, uh, you know, once again, Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, the interview is going to be up on YouTube, the IDME blog, and it'll be out about 15 different radio stations. Uh, once again, uh, Chief Science Officer, Senior Vice President of Innovation at the Chromadex Corporation, Dr. Matthew Roberts. Uh, it's just been a real honor for you <laughs> being here, and thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, I, re I really enjoyed the conversation, and, and I would be happy to come back again. There's so much more we haven't covered. I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk again.